So uh, the topic is evaluating the future and the agenda is outlined here. I'm going to start off by uh, explaining why I think um, evaluating the future has relevant, you know, the topic has relevance, uh, why the future is important to evaluators. And then I'm going to look at the subject of how to articulate alternative futures by looking at Parivo, a particular web app that's designed for the participatory exploration of alternative futures. And then I'm going to look at how it's possible to evaluate alternative futures, particularly by looking at the options within the Parivo app. And then I'm going to dive into a lot more detail into the theory of change behind uh, the application itself and, and how that might be evaluated. And then finally, I'm going to end with a discussion of some of the possible alternative futures for the Parivo app itself. In my view, evaluators are mainly busy looking backwards. They're looking at what has happened and comparing it to what was expected. But uh, there's an also an element of looking into the future in as much as when you're looking at the design of an intervention, when you're looking at the theory of change, you're looking at how things are expected to work in the future, uh, but also, at the end of an evaluation, when you're coming to conclusions and trying to draw up recommendations, you're trying to uh, make suggestions about what should be done in the future and how that might work. Theories of change are theories about the future and they vary uh, in how sophisticated they are. We have very simple linear theories of change where inputs lead to activities, lead to outputs, lead to outcomes, lead to impacts. Um, in their simplest form are just describing one route into the future. Or we, have might, we might have more network forms of theories of change where there are multiple pathways that are intersecting in different ways in different situations uh, to lead to different uh, outcomes and combinations of outcomes. And then occasionally we get more sophisticated systems models which have complex feedback loops and, and uh, we can get a view of the future by running simulations of those, simul uh, those systems models, but they're, they're relatively uncommon. So evaluators have some interest in the future, but they're also very much interested in what has happened already and drawing out lessons for the future. Some problems presented by the future. There are two problems that I want to uh, describe here. The first is about articulation of the future. It's a challenge to articulate uh, the future in two ways. Firstly, uh, the di is diversity. Uh, when we look at the future and try and um, anticipate the future, often our anticipations are just not up to the task. There's a great quote which I like. Um, Court, which says no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. I think this has its origins in, in Prussia in the 19th century. But basically, no matter, you know, we can come up lot with lots of sophisticated views of the future, but often reality just trumps us with something that we didn't expect at all. On the other hand, we can have too much diversity in our articulation of the future to the point where we don't know where we should be focusing our scarce resources and attention. And this is a sort of problem that we find even in, in network models of theories of change is with many pathways and possible, possible routes whereby outcomes can happen, where do we allocate our scarce evaluation resources? Uh, another problem with articulation is the question of depth of detail. In order to verify our theory of what's going to happen in the future, we want plenty of detail. But in order to communicate our idea of what's going to happen in the future to other stakeholders, we need less rather than more detail. The second major challenge presented by the future is the, is the problem of evaluating it. How do you evaluate something that has not yet happened? And that's something that I'll be looking at today. So I'm going to be explaining uh, this one approach to articulating and evaluating views of the future, and it's called Parivo. It's a web app and it's available at parivo.org. It's an open source online web application for developing alternative past histories or future scenarios using a participatory evolutionary process. And this diagram, which is, a, is essentially the logo of the site, I'll explain it explains how the process works. So each of these red nodes are paragraphs of text and they develop from the left to the right. And on the left hand side, we have a seed paragraph describing the beginning of a story. And we have five participants who in the second column each add 
a paragraph of their own, extending that original seed paragraph in different directions. Then in the third column, the same five participants decide which of those five extensions they want to extend again with a third paragraph. And you'll see that some paragraphs in the second column haven't been extended. Some paragraphs in the second column have been extended by more than one participant. And then we move into the, uh, to the next column where the same participants are given the same choice of extending any of the storylines they want with a new paragraph. And then we go on through a series of iterations on towards the left. So we end up with a set of storylines which are represented by the different branches in this tree. And some of the storylines have died out, some have survived, and some have proliferated. So that is uh, based on, on a, a concept of evolution as the, combination, as the reiteration of variation, selection, and retention. But you don't need to don't know too much about that theoretical background. But this is basically the kernel of how it works. And I'm now going to show you the web interface of how, in practice, this is implemented. So this is the web interface, and I'm going to describe it in simple terms first. There are three parts. The top part is guidance given to the participants, text guidance given to the participants by an exercise facilitator. On the left-hand side, we have a tree structure, a very complicated one in this instance, which is essentially a map showing how all the paragraphs of text are related into different trees. And by clicking on any one of those uh, branches, and you can see the one on the left has been clicked and that's highlighted in brighter green, that then presents the text of that storyline in the panel on the right-hand side. And that storyline on the right-hand side, you can see discrete paragraphs starting off with the seed paragraph at the top, and then a number of paragraphs that have been added by different participants as you go further down. There are a few extra details here. There's a search facility where you can search for keywords uh, in any of the storylines and they'll be, their location will be highlighted in the tree diagram and in the text of the storyline, which you can see. At the bottom left, there's a panel whereby uh, the results of people's evaluation judgments are made visible, and I'll explore that in a bit more detail. And then you'll also see there's a comment um, button under one of the storyline, uh, one of the contributions where somebody has added a comment on that particular contribution. So this is basically the panel. Um, it gets updated with each new iteration. The tree map gets updated, the storyline text gets added, and the guidance at the top gets added. So uh, when you're running a Power Evo exercise, and any one of you who are listening today are welcome to try Power Evo out. It's, it's a free uh, app and it has my support. So if you're running a Power Evo exercise, you've got a number of design choices. The first of these is about the participants the number of participants you want to have involved, uh, whether they are just a crowd of people uh, or, or people from a particular organization, whether they're representing their own views or whether they're in a role representing some uh, type of stakeholders' views or whether they're a representative of a team. And those participants can be, you need at least one person to be the facilitator of the exercise uh, you need people to be the contributor of those paragraphs that you saw. They're the key people in the exercise. And um, they will, you'll also need people to, be, to evaluate the exercise, and they will typically also be the contributors. In most cases, you ask the contributors to evaluate the, the storylines at the end. But you can also have people in the role of commentators and observers. The guidance given by the facilitator, there's a choice there about how active and versus how uh, light touch the guidance is given by the facilitator. And the facilitator needs to decide how many iterations the exercise will continue for and what time period will be covered by each iteration. Also, the facilitator will make decisions about uh, the evaluation stage, the type of questions asked and the number of the types of participants involved. So here's a, a description of some of the exercises that have been carried out recently. Um, we've carried out about 13 exercises, three in a, in a very early mock-up stage and the rest afterwards. And these have covered the topics of climate change, uh, Britain in post-Brexit Britain, sorry, post-Brexit Britain, uh, COVID and beyond, strategic planning in one organization, uh, uh, Biden 2021 America, uh, the experiences of UN volunteers, uh, the experiences of Kenyan farm trials, 
and COP26 and beyond. And the number of participants has ranged from six to 15. And these have come from communities of practice. They've been staff members of organizations, UN volunteers, and crowdsourced research subjects. The number of iterations has ranged from seven to eight, and these are often tied to calendar periods ranging from two to five years. The amount of time that each person has put into each iteration, uh, we've given people between two and five days per iteration because people have been scattered all around the world in different time zones, and they've got other things to do with their life as well as participate in such an exercise. And people have typically spent from 30 minutes up to an hour um, reading and writing their contribution per iteration. So far, we've only had two which have been uh, doing reconstruction of histories and the rest have been exploration of futures. Just a few statements here about how Parivo compares to other scenario planning approaches. When looking at the literature, it appears that with most scenario planning approaches, the, the number of scenarios developed is around three, four, five. Whereas with Parivo, uh, the number of scenarios uh, developed is equal to the number of participants. And as I've explained, they have ranged from eight to 15. So a bigger number of scenarios. The other thing is that uh, with Parivo, it's a narrative first approach in contrast to many other scenario planning approaches, which go through a lot of analysis and data collection, and then they develop narratives exemplifying particular trends which they think are likely. I think a narrative first approach is more engaging and less demanding. Thirdly, Parivo is an anonymous participatory process uh, in contrast to a face-to-face -face situation where people are not only engaging with ideas but who, who it is that's uh, communicating those ideas. So it, enab it enables the separation of ideas from egos. And uh, finally, uh, there's a big emphasis on participatory evaluation built into the Parivo planning process using both open and closed-ended inquiries, which I'll talk about a bit more. And in particular, there's evaluation attention to both the analysis of the process and the product, how people participate and the nature of the scenario uh, contents that are developed. So evaluation is an integral part of the process. And this happens at three points when contributors choose which storyline to continue. They're evaluating the different storylines in their own mind about which one interests them the most and which one they can think they can develop uh, in a way that is of most interest to them. Secondly, when commentators comment on the specific contributions, they're making judgments and, and drawing out ideas and implications from what they're reading. And thirdly, when contributors and commentators use the evaluation facility, and here uh, they can be using both built-in questions into the app plus an add-on SurveyMonkey questionnaire, and that's the bit of the evaluation process which I'll focus on mainly here. So some of the evaluation questions which are asked in a SurveyMonkey add-on at the end of the process, we ask people to identify which storyline they think is most likely, least likely, most desirable, and least desirable, and I'll talk about this a bit more later on. We ask people to sort the storylines into two groups according to what they think is the most significant difference between them and explain why that, what that difference is and why they think that difference is significant. You'll see a parallel here with most significant change. We also ask people to ask what was the most surprising content that they found in the storylines and what was the most surprising omission from the storylines. We ask them uh, for their judgment about how optimistic or pessimistic the other storylines were and how optimistic or pessimistic their contributions were. We asked them about uh, how the extent to which they feel that the storylines will have an effect on them and how much they think they will be able to affect the events described in the storylines. That's about agency. And finally, we asked them about uh, how useful the comments were in general and in particular, which ones they were found most useful. So lots of information there coming out of those questions. So I want to now step back and look at the broad question of availability of Parivo exercises. And I'll look at this uh, from, uh, from four perspectives. Firstly, looking at the theory of change. And the theory of change uh, exists here at two levels. There's at the, at the, what I call the platform level, which is what I'm operating, the parivo.org site. There's a theory of change at that level. 
but individual facilitators who are running particular exercises will have their own theory of change about why they're engaging this particular group of participants uh, to look at this particular subject uh, and and yeah and and it might be about the future or the past but they'll have their own expectations of what they're trying to achieve there i'm going to be talking mainly about the platform level theory of change the second dimension of availability is uh, the availability of data and this is least problematic i think we've got stacks of data uh, generated by these such exercises Stakeholders' demands and interests affect uh, availability of, of an intervention, and that is true here. I think in both cases, particularly the, uh, at the platform level, my interest in what I want to get evaluated, what I want to discover out of this platform is something that's uh, been emergent rather than identified from the very beginning. And I'll describe that a bit more as we go along. Finally, there are usually, within any evaluation, there are institutional constraints and opportunities. In the case of the platform, uh, which, uh, I've set this up myself, so I don't have any institution telling me what I can and cannot do. Um, on the other hand, uh, at the exercise level, I'm sure with every exercise, a facilitator will have certain constraints. For example, um, with an evaluation, uh, the clients of the evaluation will have, uh, and the participants in the evaluation will have uh, requirements for confidentiality about what has been produced, which might limit the extent to which um, the facilitator can make use of the evaluation findings. So the platform level theory about Power Evo has three elements. Uh, firstly, that a diversity of storylines will help us better prepare for the future. And I have a metaphor here of a fishing net uh, as uh, what we're creating is a, a net of uh, storylines that might help us catch possibilities that are worth examining. It's not like we will find one particular view of the future which will just really snap onto what's actually going to happen. That seems extremely unlikely. Rather, we're looking for a range of possibilities which, as a group, will help better prepare us for the future. Secondly, and related, closely related to this, is uh, the expectation of increasing what's called our metacognitive capacity, our capacity uh, uh, to expand our, the ways in which we think about the future. So this involves a form of evaluative thinking and has been described elsewhere as li um, futures literacy. And the third expected outcome is increased knowledge about how to achieve these two objectives. And the, this is through the analysis of, of data generated by multiple Parevo exercises. And that body of data is accumulating. So I also have a bit of a, a, a theory informing, uh, background theory informing the, these, how these outcomes will be achieved. And it all relates to the concept of diversity, in particular a paper by Andy Sterling in 2007 from the uh, University of Sussex, which disaggregates um, uh, diversity into three aspects. Variety, the kind of things that exist, balance, the number of each of those kinds of things, and disparity, just how different or similar those, uh, those various things are. And there's been quite a lot of work in the field of collective intelligence about the role of diversity in enabling groups to be more effective than individuals. In addition, uh, there are a number of measures within the field of social network analysis that enable us to measure diversity, which is very helpful. And finally, I think diversity is what I would call value consistent. It's consistent with a sort of pluralistic view of the world where we want to maximize people's opportunities to, uh, subject to the constraint that those don't limit other people's opportunities. So in terms of um, outcomes, di uh, the diversity of outcomes, we want to look at that in a, as a diversity of storylines. And we can see this in two ways, looking at the diversity of uh, just how closely all those storylines are connected in the tree structure. But we can also look at the results of the pile sorts that um, when I ask people in the survey question about sorting the storylines into different groups, we can do analysis of those results to see how closely the different groups are. We can also look at diversity in terms of participant behavior as a potential cause in, uh, and we look at the network structure of who is contributing to whose who's storylines and we can measure diversity there. And we can also look at different forms of cooperation emerging during these exercises, which I will give you a concrete example shortly. So I'm going to now give you two examples of analysis uh, following on from that 
broader perspective. In this first scatter plot, you can see the red nodes. The nodes are the different storylines that have survived. And the bottom axis is desirability, going from least to most. And the left axis is uh, likelihood, going from least to most. So we've got storylines which vary in how likely and how desirable they are. And the evaluation questions here are, are of these types. Firstly, we can ask what types of storylines are missing? Where are the big empty spaces um, in, in, uh, in, in this space? And they are probably on the right-hand side, but they're not all that prominent. But just asking what types of storylines are we not capturing, that is the first really important question. And secondly, we can ask what type of storylines are contested, that where the judgments about likelihood or desirability are contested. And these are the red nodes in the, in the scatter plot. And then we can look at the particular uh, types of storylines here. We've got four quadrants representing different types of storylines. For example, least desirable but most likely storylines in the top left uh, are one group we might be interested in. And then the bottom right, most desirable but less likely storylines are another group that we might want to look at. And clearly they would probably generate different implications for action. And then finally, another evaluation question is, what other axes could we be plotting these storylines on which might be useful for us to explore apart from likelihood and desirability? Sustainability and equity strike me as being two other axes that would be useful to plot the storylines on and ask these same questions about what has been attended to and which ones are contested, etc. The second framework uh, is uh, another scatter plot looking at the uh, analysis of participation. And here the nodes are not storylines, but participants. And the, the two axes are social network analysis measures, which I'll explain. The one on the left is called out degree. And this is the number of others who have contributed, no, sorry, the number of others whose contributions I have added to. And in degree on the bottom is the number of others who have added to my contribution. So it's all about receiving and giving behavior. And so uh, in the top right hand corner, we've got people who've both received contributions and given contributions, bridging. And the bottom left corner, we've got people who haven't given many contributions to others and haven't received many. I've described that as a separating behavior. On the top left, we've got people who have given contributions to others, but not received many. That's described as following. And on the bottom right hand corner, I've got people who have received contributions from others, but not given many to others. And I've described that as leading. So the evaluation question here is, are any one of these types of uh, behaviors most important in terms of generating a diversity of useful diversity of storylines? Or is it really the mix of these behaviors that really matters? And another evaluation question is about the, the balance between what's described exploration and exploitation behavior. On the bottom left hand corner, people are going out on their own, doing ex just exploring possibilities and nobody else is following them. On the top right hand corner, we've got people who are both building on other people's work and other people are building on their work. And that's more a matter of exploiting existing ideas. So uh, the last bit about evaluation I want to talk about is about post evaluation, post exercise evaluation questions. And uh, the three topics here I want to look at. Firstly, we should pay attention to what observers think about the exercise results, other observers. In the uh, UNV evaluation, they were able to survey 600 plus other UNV volunteers about the results of the uh, Parivo exercise, which involved about 10 or 12 participants. We can also ask the participants in an exercise what they did differently after an exercise. And my feeling at the moment is the best approach to way to do this is by using most significant change type questions and perhaps focused on particular areas about, you know, um, did you do anything about the contested judgments? Did you do anything about those identified gaps? Did you do anything about those high probability but low desirability futures? What changed there? 
And finally, we can look at what hap happened in reality and how it compared to the content of storylines, not from the point of view of just giving a simple, you know, correct or incorrect answer, but more from the point of view of finding out what does that tell us about how adequately we were thinking about the future? How can that, inf that feedback inform the way we think about the future in the future? Finally, uh, the last slide I've got here is about alternative futures for the Parivo app itself. The first one is about role specialization, making more use of different stakeholders uh, in different roles. And the exercise which is underway at the moment, which is looking at climate change, I've got people who are commenting on the storylines who I think have got more expert knowledge than the participants themselves. And that is proving to be quite a useful process. Another possibility is what they call gamification. And this is where we could provide feedback to all the participants on the number of contributions uh, they have received relative uh, received from other participants relative to all the other participants. Pros and cons on that, yet to be seen what effect it has. The other possibility is what I call extended anonymization. At the moment, participation is anonymized, but the facilitator does know who the, who the participants are. There is a possibility of doing things in such a way that even the facilitator will not know who each contribution has come from. And this may be important when you're trying to deal with really sensitive possible futures. Finally, I'm really interested in exploring the use of Parevo to help design theories of change in development programs as an input, as, as, a, as a stage prior to the development of any diagrammatic versions. 